Hello everyone and welcome back to this Nanophotonics and Plasmonics course. Uh, in the previous video we've introduced some fascinating properties of the photonic crystals. Uh, in today's video we're going to actually focus on the physics of those photonic crystals and uh, try to lay down the foundations uh, of the theoretical framework that underline these interesting optical properties. So in order to calculate the optical properties of uh, the photonic crystals, uh, we need to solve Max's equations for a periodic uh, dielectric medium. Uh, so if you consider uh, a one-dimensional periodic structure, uh, which is uh, organized along uh, one given direction, you're taking as the Z direction, uh, which is composed of layers uh, of different materials with dielectric permittivity epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Uh, each of this layer has a thickness uh, d. So if you solve Max's equations uh, for this particular system, uh, then you're gonna end up with uh, two type of optical modes uh, which can be distinguished. Uh, so the first one, the, uh, transverse electric mode, uh, for which the electric field is actually uh, aligned with a direction parallel to the to the interfaces, so here taken as the x direction, uh, and then there's the transverse magnetic modes uh, where the magnetic fields are uh, parallel uh, to the uh, interfaces, uh, also taken in this particular case in the x direction. So now within each layer, n these uh, electric field and magnetic field uh, are superposition of both forward and backward waves. Uh, so this is expressed uh, here as just a summation of uh, waves that are propagating in, uh, in, uh, along the z direction and waves that are propagating uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, this tells you that's basically that within each layer, uh, the electric field or, or the magnetic field or just the superposition of transmitted and reflected waves uh, coming from uh, interfaces uh, between those different layers. Uh, so the, the, the KZ uh, and the K parallel or the longitudinal and parallel wave numbers. Uh, so in order to determine those coefficients A and B, uh, we need to, uh, to actually calculate and apply the boundary conditions uh, between the, the different layers. So if you look at the boundary conditions between uh, a layer N and the consecutive layer n plus one, uh, then we have boundary conditions for this transverse electric mode, uh, which is gonna look at the continuity of the uh, longitudinal component of the electric field uh, or the longitudinal component of the magnetic field. Uh, those two equations where we have the derivatives of these electric and magnetic fields uh, directly come from the transverse component continuity of the electric and magnetic field. Now, if you inject the expression for the electric field and magnetic field, and that was laid uh, just the previous slide into those uh, boundary conditions, uh, then you're gonna end up with uh, expressions that connect the A and B coefficients uh, with the A n plus one, A B n plus one coefficients. So we have uh, two equations uh, that are actually connecting uh, four coefficients. So we have the coefficient a and b uh, in layer one, which correspond to uh, material uh, epsilon one. And then we have uh, the coefficient a n plus one, a b n plus one, uh, which correspond to the materials two uh, or epsilon two. So we have two equations for unknowns, uh, so we can actually apply the boundary conditions between n uh, and n minus one uh, this time and obtain two very similar equations. Um, so this is the, the, these are the four equations that we have, uh, we have four, four equations, but now we have six unknowns. So we have uh, a n, b n, a n plus one, b n plus one, a n minus one, and b n minus one. So we have four unknowns and six equations. So we cannot solve these, uh, this system of equa equations for the moment. And we need to introduce, in fact, the Floquet block theorem in order to solve uh, this system. So the Floquet block uh, theorem simply states that uh, if uh, we have an electric field uh, within a periodic medium, 
with a periodicity uh, of 2D, then therefore the electric field uh, in position Z uh, plus 2D, so Z plus once, uh, one time the periodicity, is simply the electric field at uh, position Z uh, times a phase, a phase factor. So this exponential introducing a phase factor between the, the, the electric field at position Z and the electric field at position Z plus 2D. Uh, so this introduces a block uh, wave vector that we're not going to discuss uh, more for the moment, but this is basically uh, dictated by the periodicity and the composition of this uh, periodic arrangement of materials. So with this, uh, with this block uh, theorem, uh, so we have this uh, relationship uh, that allows to express uh, the uh, electric field between, uh, between different layers. We have also a similar equation for the, for the magnetic field. Uh, and this basically uh, really allows to express the uh, a, uh, a n plus g as a function of a n minus g. Uh, and we have the same for, uh, for the, the b coefficients. Uh, with this introduction here, we can reduce the number of unknown to four. So then we have four equations with four unknowns, uh, which can be solved. Uh, we, uh, we end up with this uh, characteristic equation. Uh, so we have uh, uh, this cosine 2 times the block uh, wave vector times d, uh, which is the thickness of a single layer. And then we have this, uh, this long term on the right hand side of the equation. So because we have a cosine function on the left hand side of this equation, therefore this right hand side of the equation must be in the range negative 1, 1. Uh, so because some, for some values, these we actually not uh, be satisfied. So if you, if you choose some KZ uh, values that do not satisfy this equation, uh, this is going to form what we call the band gaps. So the band gaps are just basically absence of solutions. Uh, just to illustrate this, uh, if you take uh, the case of a normal incident uh, optical excitation, uh, then therefore the, the longitudinal wave numbers Kz is expressed as, as follows. So we have the square root of the dielectric permittivity in medium one and medium two. Uh, we have omega, which is the frequency of the optical excitation uh, which is also uh, 2 pi c over lambda, the wavelength, uh, over c. Uh, so if you consider this particular normal excitation, uh, you consider that the two materials, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, are with uh, dielectric permittivities of 2.25 and, uh, and 9, uh, respectively. Uh, so if you take an optical excitation with uh, a wavelength of uh, 12d, uh, so basically you can substitute this, this value uh, to calculate the actual uh, Kz value, and then you inject that into the characteristic equation, uh, then you should end up with the right hand side of this in this equation equal to negative 0 0.9. So negative 0 0.9, uh, this is within the range negative 1, 1. So therefore, 12D can actually propagate through the photonic crystal because it's solution of this, uh, this equation. Uh, on the other end, if you take lambda equal 90, uh, you calculate the corresponding Kz uh, values, you inject that into the characteristic equations, and you end up with the right hand side of the equation equal to negative 1.2. So one, negative 1 1.2, uh, which is equal to negative 1, so obviously uh, lambda equal 90 is not a solution uh, of this characteristic equation, and therefore this particular wave with this particular uh, wavelength and normal incidence cannot propagate through the photonic crystal. And this is what uh, we know as the photonic band gap. So let's discuss a little bit uh, the physics behind this photonic band gap. Uh, so if you have uh, an incoming wave, uh, which has uh, a wavelength or an energy frequency within the band gap, this incident wave uh, will be superimposed over the entire space uh, and that's going to give rise to reflected waves at each interface. Uh, each of these reflected waves from each uh, of the uh, periodic elements will actually be in phase uh, and these in phase reflected waves uh, will interfere uh, with the incident wave 
within the periodic structure and will give rise to stationary waves that actually are decaying uh, in space and will not propagate uh, through the periodic crystal. So this is uh, when the energy of the Sincian wave is actually in the band gap. So we have uh, constructive interferences, uh, destructive interferences between uh, the reflected waves and the incident wave. Now, uh, if it's not in the band gap, then all the reflected waves will also be out of phase with uh, respect to each other, and then we cancel out. Uh, so then in the end, you have only this incident wave that will propagate freely through the photonic crystal. So this is the physics behind those, those, uh, those equations. Uh, so how does it look like? Uh, you can actually uh, calculate uh, what are the values uh, of energy that allows the propagation of, uh, of fields inside a given photonic crystal uh, and plot this for different uh, parallel curve vectors. Uh, so you have the T modes and the TM modes uh, for the case of a one-dimensional crystal. So all those gray areas here are actually modes that are allowed to propagate. So these are combinations of uh, k-vectors and energies uh, that are allowed to propagate through the photonic crystal. So if you look at this particular case where k parallel is equal to zero, this is normal incidence with uh, respect to the, to the surface of the, the, the 1D photonic crystal. Uh, so you see that we have this region where there's no mode available, so this is the normal incidence band gap. So if you have normal incidence, uh, like we, we just discussed as, uh, in the example, uh, if you pick a wavelength of uh, 9D, then you fall within this range, and therefore there's no mode available. Nothing's going to propagate through this photonic crystal. Now if you're in the 12D, then you're going to be in the, in the region below, uh, so we are higher wavelength, and therefore we are lower energy, and therefore the mode will be able to propagate within the photonic crystal. So in 1D photonic crystals, there's no complete uh, band gap. Uh, so what that means is that basically there's no frequency for which the propagation is actually inhibited uh, in all directions. So if I take uh, this particular example, uh, so in normal incidence, there's a band gap for this particular energy. So if I take this value of 0.5, then if I just uh, tune the k vector, uh, I can reach a value here which is actually allowed. So for this particular energy, this particular k vector normal incidence is not able to propagate, uh, but I can actually obtain propagation if I change the k vector uh, to match this particular value. Uh, so there's no complete uh, complete band gap. However, if you actually consider the fact that if you have a, a wave uh, propagating in vacuum. So the, the light line will be given by those dashed lines. So this is the, the dispersion line of light propagating in a vacuum, connecting the, with the speed of light and the, the momentum of light. Uh, then therefore, every k vector we're going to be smaller than the, 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 the momentum of light will be able to, to propagate. In that case, we can uh, determine those complete uh, band gap regions that are enclosed within the light line. So uh, for the for this propagation of light in free space, once they, they reach the photonic crystal, uh, they will not be able to propagate at all uh, because of the, the restrictions on the K vector. So we can obtain uh, band structures uh, for uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional periodic uh, crystals photonic crystals. Uh, we can also observe in the case of two-dimensional crystals also the, the T modes and the TM modes separately. Uh, we can observe the formation of a photonic band gap uh, in 2D and in 3D as well. Uh, in that particular case, uh, you see that you have a complete photonic band gap, uh, meaning that for, the, for this particular energy range here, uh, then no, uh, no matter what the k-vector is, light will not propagate through the photonic crystal. So this is actually considered as a, as a perfect uh, omnidimensional mirror for this particular set of frequency. You can characterize these uh, photonic crystals uh, with optical uh, measurements or optical calculations. So this is an example of a transmittance. So this is 
the light being transmitted through uh, a 10 period photonic crystal. So one dimensional photonic crystal composed of 10 periods uh, of uh, alternating materials with refractive indices of 1.34 and 3.4 uh, with those specific uh, thicknesses at normal incidence. So what we, we see here is that we have regions of uh, the spectrum where you have very large transmission. So light is actually being transmitted uh, transmitted through for a very specific uh, region uh, of the spectrum. And then therefore we have this, uh, this very large uh, region of the spectrum where there's no transmission. So this region is really uh, zero transmission. So no light is being transmitted as a total reflection. Uh, this corresponds to the to the photonic band gap. Uh, so this is a little bit misleading. Also, you have, uh, you have to be careful, and we're gonna see that in the next slide. Uh, you have this uh, small portion of the spectrum between 500 and 600 nanometers where there's no transmission, uh, and you could actually easily confuse this with the photonic band gap. So keeping in mind that this is actually given at only one particular uh, k vector value. So this is at normal incidence when the the, the key vector is uh, along a given direction. So for this particular direction, there's no transmission in this uh, 500 to 600 nanometers range, uh, but there might be transmission uh, for a different key vectors in this particular spectral range. Uh, to better illustrate that, uh, it's better to, to compare uh, transmission uh, spectra with photonic band structures. So this is a uh, comparison. Uh, so the, we have the the photonic band structure uh, shown at the center uh, for the different directions uh, in reciprocal space, so the different values of k-vectors. Uh, and we have uh, on the left-hand side the transmission uh, along the, the gamma m direction. So this is transmission uh, with a k-vector along this, uh, these values. And then on the right-hand side, we have transmission with a k-vector, an incident k-vector uh, which is uh, which is different. So this is the, the gamma uh, gamma k direction. So looking at different incidences uh, on this uh, hexagonal uh, photonic crystal. So what we can see is that uh, when we have energies uh, that are in this uh, in this range here uh, in the gamma direction, gamma m direction, or the gamma k direction, uh, then we have a very high transmission. So we have transmission of of one uh, on uh, on the on either uh, either case, uh, and then we we reach higher energies uh, and that fall into this uh, photonic band gap. Uh, so you see that uh, no matter what uh, wave vector we have, uh, gamma m or gamma k, uh, we have no mode available, and therefore we we, we have uh, zero transmission. So in this case, we have transmission which is zero uh, on on either side. Uh, now the comment I've made just before is something that we can see here. So we have in this particular case, in the gamma m direction, so in this uh, portion of the photonic band, uh, band diagram, uh, there's no mode available. Uh, so we have therefore uh, zero transmission, but this is not a complete band gap because for this uh, particular uh, range of energy in the gamma x direction, gamma k direction, we have modes available so if you change the, the key vector, you can actually obtain very high transmission uh, within this particular uh, photonic crystal. Uh, you can actually look at also the, how the local electric field uh, distributes within the, uh, the photonic crystal. So this is the, the uh, Z component of the, the electric field uh, spatial distribution. Uh, or the, in other words, the out of plane uh, component of the electric field uh, for the different the different modes uh, taken at the uh, the m at the m point. So this is the uh, the m point here. So this particular energy, if you have a mode uh, with this particular k vector uh, propagating, uh, then the electric field distribution is going to look like this. Uh, the second field distribution correspond to this particular uh, this particular mode optical modes, and then we have. Uh, for each of these modes along the uh, the M direction, we have a specific near uh, local electric field distribution within the photonic crystal. So we can identify what type of uh, of mode we have propagating uh, through the photonic crystals. 
So we can calculate the photonic band structure of a different type of uh, photonic crystals using the fine difference time domain, uh, which once again will be uh, discussed uh, in chapter seven. So uh, we can start with a two-dimensional square lattice uh, composed of uh, nano disks uh, with a, a refractive index of uh, n equal two. And we can actually calculate uh, the band structure for this particular lattice. Uh, so this is a fairly sparse lattice. You see that the distance between the disk is uh, much larger than the, the size of the, of the disk. And this is the band structure uh, we obtain for this particular, this particular lattice. So you have the, the brain zone here indicating the three major uh, reciprocal points, symmetry points, the gamma point, uh, the X and the M. And you can identify uh, all those different modes. Now, uh, we can see that we have two band gaps that are formed in this particular structure. We have a large band gap at lower energy and uh, another significant band gap at slightly higher energy. Now, if you take the exact same uh, square lattice uh, with the exact same uh, composition, but now you change uh, the size of this of this lattice uh, or you change the, the distance between those uh, those disks, uh, you actually can recalculate the band structure uh, and then you can see that in this particular case we closed uh, both band gaps. So here uh, this energy range where we used to have a band gap of the, the previous lattice is now uh, is not closed. Uh, so you can uh, engineer the optical response of this uh, of this lattice changing the, the size or the, or the, even the shape or uh, the, the composition or the separation of these uh, building blocks. Uh, now this is uh, something you can play with uh, using FDTD. You can uh, change uh, all the parameters you want and recalculate the photonic band uh, structure of these photonic crystals. Uh, you can also change the uh, type of lattice we have. So this was a square lattice. Uh, you can have a, a triangular lattice. Uh, so we have a different billion, billion zone because now we have a different type of unit cell. Uh, with different symmetry points, gamma, M, and K. Uh, so you see that with the same disks, same composition as the first one, but now going from the square lattice to, uh, to a triangular lattice, uh, then you, uh, you also have uh, no band gap as opposed to the first one. So uh, as a side note, uh, the transition from this first square lattice to this uh, second uh, triangular lattice uh, is exactly what the chameleon does. So the chameleon is able to, to engineer the photonic band structure uh, of these on uh, guanine uh, nanocrystal lattice. Uh, you can also do uh, three-dimensional photonic crystals. Uh, this is an example of a FCC lattice uh, composed of uh, spheres, uh, dielectric uh, N equal two as well. Uh, so you see that now because of the, the three-dimension uh, lattice uh, nature, so now we have a, a much more complex photonic diagram uh, where we have way more symmetry points. Uh, so you, in this particular case, there's no band gap, but you can actually play around with the parameters, size, composition, and separation distance between the, the nanoparticles. You can actually uh, engineer and control this uh, band structure uh, in order to open a specific uh, band gap.